Thanks for joining us. This is Verbatim Word, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. I'm Justin Gary. At the time of this recording, it's about Christmas time, so we're going to take a little break from our regular study in the book of Ephesians and look at something from the Christmas story in Scripture. Now, before you turn off this podcast, don't worry. If you're listening at another time of the year, it's not really a Christmas teaching, so the truths we're going to look at today will apply to you at any time, any place, whenever you get to listen to this. So don't switch off the lesson just yet. In this podcast, we want to look at what it means to be led. When we say we were led to do something, what exactly? are we saying? What does it imply to be led? Well, it means really that someone else is in the driver's seat at that moment, that you're heading into unknown or unfamiliar territory and someone else knows the way and you don't exactly know it. Being led also implies movement. You're going from where you are to someplace a little different. The Bible is full of individuals who were led by God. They're being led to do things or to go places or to make choices. Think about Noah. He was led to build an ark. Or Abraham. He was led to leave Ur of the Chaldees and head to Canaan. Or Israel was led as a nation out of Egypt. But the Bible is also full of examples of those who were led by other influencers and the unfortunate fates that followed when they decided to be led by those other forces. Going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when Eve was led by some other influence that did not have God's heart or mind in the counsel that was given. Being led by God is a key to the Christian's experience. So we better learn to master it. In the Christmas story, there's a theme of being led throughout it. The wise men were led by a star. The shepherds were led by the good news of the angels. But on this podcast, we want to focus in particular on Joseph and Mary being led to Bethlehem and a practical study in just how God leads his people. Because our lives may not be a part of scripture, but God himself, with all his power and all his eternal purposes, is seeking to lead you and seeking to lead me, whether we know it or not, and whether we respond or not. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 2. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at part of the Christmas story in Scripture, but it's not exactly a Christmas teaching. But the Scripture we look at takes place in the Gospel of Luke. What do we know about Luke, the author of this Gospel? Well, most people see that he was a doctor of some sort in those days, and he also gives lots of details in his writings, other insights that other authors of the Gospels do not actually provide in their versions of it. I wonder sometimes if Luke, this doctor, was some kind of a a fact geek, someone who really liked the details when it came to things. I'd probably get along with him because I like information and details as well. Well, as we read Luke's account, we see details and specifics and information that Luke gives that we don't find anywhere else. We look in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. What a familiar story. Right now I can hear Silent Night playing in the background in my mind as I read through this story, the typical Christmas story that leads us to the nativity scene. But there's a lot more under this that we can apply at any time of the year. First of all, look at some of the details that Luke, this fact geek, he provides. There's a lot of credibility, a lot of facts, verified events, Caesar Augustus, this decree, when Quirinius was governing Syria, these locations, lots of details there, not just skipping over the story. Let's fill in some of the blanks, first of all. Historically, he was Caesar Augustus. Well, this Augustus was actually Julius Caesar's great nephew. He was adopted by him, and there were three rulers. Caesar Augustus was one of them, and these two of the rulers brushed off the third one. Augustus defeated the other, plus Cleopatra's combined forces. So he was a pretty powerful, respected leader at this time. 
Augustus means someone who's a supreme leader. Rome had been a republic up until then, governed by the laws of the people, but now it was an empire with the supreme leader, Caesar Augustus. At this time also was the Pax Romana. There was, had been years of wars and disunity and economic collapse and poverty, but during this time they had brought some kind of unity to the kingdom. But now let's look at it biblically. What were Joseph and Mary's circumstances in this time? Well, legally, she wasn't really married to him yet. She was betrothed. And so she was not yet really required to go with Joseph down to that town. So why did she go? Well, I wonder, maybe she actually wasn't full term. When we look at the Christmas story, we often see Mary was so fully pregnant on the, on the back of the donkey going down there. She gives birth because her time was at hand. Perhaps they were there for a little bit longer than the census, though. And this census or this counting was an opportunity for them to get out of Nazareth. If you remember, there was lots of rumors going around. There was lots of stories going around. Mary was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And there was a lot of scandal behind that. Maybe it was a chance to get away from the scandal, a chance to kind of clear the air for a couple months. Well, while they were there, of course, they gave birth. But they were in the city of David. Who is this David? Why is it significant? David was the king to whom the Messiah was promised. He came from this same place. And it's important because the Messiah that was to be coming would come from the line of David. In fact, if we read in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Out of Bethlehem would come the Messiah. Well, wait a second. Mary and Joseph were up in Nazareth. That's an 80 mile journey. That's not just around the corner. How were they going to get Mary, who was carrying the Messiah from Nazareth down to Bethlehem? There's no way at this point in her pregnancy that she would go on this journey any other way but perhaps the circumstances of a scandal and perhaps the invitation of a govern governing mandate might lead them to be someplace that they weren't supposed to be. Who was leading Mary and Joseph? How were they being led? What was leading them? Would you say that they were being led by God? The things the Lord can do on a bigger scale to accomplish his will not just a lot of little things, but even the big things on a global scale that he can sometimes use to accomplish his purposes. We've been in 2020 under the mercy of circumstances, haven't we? Coronavirus pandemics, racial tensions, just economic situations, all these things that are really out of our control. And yet it's so good to know that God is in control and that God is able to accomplish his purposes, even when governing man makes decisions. Somehow he's sovereign behind those. The things that the Lord can do on a bigger scale to accomplish his will. For Mary and Joseph, it meant a decree that they had to go back home. And so they were. They were in the right place at the right time, and they probably didn't even know it. They probably weren't even aware of it. We want to look at two things as we continue in this podcast today. First of all, how does God lead us practically? And second of all, why should we be led by the Lord? Why should we let him lead our lives? Now, this subject of being led, it really is a lot different when we look at it through the eyes of a Christian, because the rest of the world is not considering being led from above, though we are. Think about it for a second. What led you before you knew Jesus? And what leads the world and people in the world today to do what they do? What leads their choices, their steps? What's behind those things? It's pretty complex, actually. A lot of times it's circumstances or the natural drives that we have or outside pressures or even impulses. Those things can often lead us if we're apart from Christ. And the Bible paints a consistent picture of what leading looks like apart from God. For example, in Romans chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, Paul writes this, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Paul says that before we come to Christ, sin is actually reigning. That word reign there, that means something sovereign, something making the decision, something making the call, something that we have to obey. 
He says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Those in the moment desires, those unfulfilled desires that just kind of those, they, they drive you to do what you need to do. Paul says that is what's leading us before we come to God. And even as we are Christians, we need to be careful that those things don't continue to lead us because they've been so used to being in the driver's seat for so long. Sometimes they're reluctant to take a back seat. A second verse says in James chapter one, verses 14 and 15, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth death. James writes there that we are drawn away. That word there is to be lured out, almost as in hunting. If you're trying to get something to come out in the open so you can get a clear shot of it, that's what he says that our desires are doing. They're drawing us away. They're luring us out to do things that we may not otherwise do. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 8, 19, it says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Wow, John points out that leading us also in this world before we know God, there's a whole world that's lying under the sway of the wicked one, under the influence of the wicked one, under the flow of the wicked one. He's actually leading a lot of what goes on in our own lives, our own hearts, and even in this world. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, Paul writes to Timothy, For of this sort are some are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. When he talks about these disruptive women, he talks about them being led away by various lusts. Various. There's different types of lust. It's not always that sensual type that we often think, but it's those base desires that think, if I can just fulfill this, then I'll be okay. And they're never satisfied. And so we're constantly led from one drive to one desire, to one hunger, to one longing, and they're never fulfilling us. All these scriptures paint a picture of what it's like to be led apart from Jesus Christ. It's a dead end. It leads us nowhere. It's fruitless and it's empty. So when we become Christians, everything changes. In fact, when we say what's called sometimes the sinner's prayer, we know that we ask forgiveness. We acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross. But in that prayer, we're also surrendering the lordship and the leadership of our life to Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If you confess with, the, with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Part of getting saved is the belief, the belief that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is God who came in the flesh, that he lived a perfect sinless life, that he went on the cross and paid for my sins, and then he resurrected from the dead to show me that those sins are forgiven. That's part of it. But Paul writes in Romans 10 verse 9 that you have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus as well. There's a confession that takes place of saying, Lord, I have led my life long enough. And the choices I've made, the paths I've taken myself on, they have been fruitless. They have been futile. And so I restore you to the Lordship. I give you the keys. I put you back in the driver's seat. Lord, will you begin leading once again? That's what it means to come to faith in Christ. And when we do that, there's new leadership taking place. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, Peter writes, For you were like sheep going astray. They were leading themselves by their own desires, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Paul acknowledges that when we come to Christ, we have a good shepherd, a good shepherd who knows the way, who leads us in directions that are best for us. In Psalm 23, verse 1, and even in the Old Testament, there was that acknowledgement of being led by God, that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Throughout the scripture, it shows us when we are led by God, it is good, it is blessed, and it is purposeful. Biblically, think about it. What examples of people do we have being led by God? And we look at their lives in Scripture and we say, oh, they were being led by God. Well, think about it. The prophets, some of them were led to speak, led to say the messages, led to get, deliver the messages and the words that they were told to speak. The others were faithful men and women. They were led to obey by the conviction of what was right and by the Holy Scriptures, doing what they should do in the eyes of God and not doing what man was telling was okay or was leading them or tempting them to do. 
We see in the scriptures um, seeking of divine leading. We see David. He was praying and asking for military strategy advice, asking God to lead him at work, asking God to lead his troops in a very practical situation. We see in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. God was leading them. God had a plan. God had a strategy that if David would just take a moment to ask about it, God would give him his insights. Now, sometimes we chuckle at that or we think, I don't want to bother God. God is the God of the universe upon this throne. And why would he be interested in, in giving me any advice in my life right now? I wonder sometimes if we ask the Lord, Lord, what's your will for me? What's your will for me to wear to work today? What's your will for me to eat today? Lord, do you have an opinion about that? I think we should ask those questions a little more often because he's going to give us, yes, this is something I want to do or no, don't do that. Or he's going to say, I don't care. You have the freedom right now. Just choose wisely. So asking God, we're always going to get an answer. The problem is oftentimes is we're not asking God to lead us even in the practical things of life. Think about Israel in the wilderness as well. They were led by a pillar of fire at night and by a cloud by day. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 12 says, Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the road which they should travel. Now, when I step out my door in the morning, I don't necessarily see a pillar of fire or a cloud that's actually leading me through the day. But God does want to give us light on the road which we should travel every single day. God wants to illuminate our paths. God wants to point us in the right direction. God wants to put green arrows telling us to turn left or yellow lights telling us to slow down or red lights telling us to stop. God is interested in leading our lives because we have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. He provides oversight. He's generally concerned and genuine, gen, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Genuinely concerned about the steps we take each and every single day. He led them with a pillar of fire to give them light on the road which they should travel. God has an opinion about where your life should be going and he wants to lead you on that path. But is this just a biblical thing? What about us? What if I ask God about where I should go to work or where I should live or what I should do in the next month or what I should wear that day or what I should eat? Is God really planning to answer me? Well, let's look at this. Our first question, how does God lead us? If an unbelieving friend were to ask you, how does God lead you? How does God lead his people? How would you explain it to them? It can be a little tricky, and sometimes those of us who have walked with the Lord for some time, we can look back at our lives and say, God led me to do that. I felt God leading in that circumstance. But to try and explain that or articulate that sometimes, that can be a challenge. How do you explain how an unseen eternal God leads us in our simple, finite lives? Well, today I want to look at four things that I think we can look at as kind of these measurements or these milestones to see, is God really leading me? The first one is God will lead us through his word, the Bible. When it comes to God's word, God has spoken, it is written, it is permanent, it does not change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's two types of looking at the word though, and there's two words we wanna look at. One is the logos of the word, and one is the rhema of the word. When it comes to the word logos, the word, it's the basic truth that expressed is expressed in the Bible. It's things that are not changing. It is scripture. I can read it. You can read it. It's going to speak the exact same thing to us. That's the logos of the Bible. For example, I remember our first year being married. We were living in Slovenia in our apartment there, and we had had an argument about something. I was upset about something. I mean, it wasn't an explosive argument, but something was really eating away at me. And I remember we went to bed and I was a little bit angry and we kind of continued talking about it, continued. I was bickering about it a little bit. And finally, at some point, I got so fed up. I got up and I left the room and I went to sleep in the guest room. Now, we were only married for a couple months, so this was like a big thing to go sleep in the guest room. It was like, I'm, I'm done with this. I can't deal with this. And I remember being in that room, tossing and turning, and I could not go back to sleep. And the logos of the word pierced my heart. 
it said, do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do you see why, Justin? Because if you let the sun go down, you're not going to sleep. The issue is not settled. It's going to carry over to tomorrow. So I had to swallow my pride as a young husband. I had to get up. I had to go back in the room and I had to say, I'm sorry. I can't sleep. God's not letting me sleep because I have sin in my heart right now because I'm letting the sun go down on my anger. And we had to get beyond it. That's the logos of the word. How does God lead us? Simple. Just read your Bible. There's so much of what we're thinking during the day of what we should do. Should I do this? Should I do that? It's just right there in scripture. We just need to know the scripture. We just need to quote the scripture. We just need to find the scripture. Look up what does God say about that topic? Many times he'll lead you by simply reading it on the page. But then there's the rhema of the word. This is sometimes when you're seeking something. You might see something in the scriptures that doesn't necessarily apply to anyone else, but God begins to speak to you through his word, this inspired word of God for your life and for your circumstances. For example, oftentimes I've helped serve in Spain in the summers for a ministry called Edge Project. And there's a kind of a questioning time every single year, Lord, do you want us to go back? Do you want us to go back again? And I remember one time I was just actively praying and saying, Lord, I don't know if I should be going back this year. Is that what you have for our summer? Is that what you have planned? I want to be led by you. And I was just going through the scriptures in my regular time. And it wasn't the logos of the word that time. It was the reign of the word. Reading there in the Gospel of Mark, it said, he went to the sea to teach again. The invitation for me to Spain was to go and teach that summer. And the town that we go to is right along the seaside. And for some reason, when I read that, it opened up for me. And it was like the Lord saying through his word, Justin, I want you to go to the sea to teach again. And so I accepted the invitation. We went and we had a fruitful ministry of summer of ministry that summer. Another time, it was about a year or two later, same thing. I was like, okay, Lord, are we going to Spain this summer? I want to hear from you. I don't want to just make up my own mind or say that, yeah, there's an open door. There's an invitation. We should go. And I was at church one night. We were at a prayer meeting and someone was sharing a word. And it was the story of Elijah in the Old Testament. And it had not rained for so long. And then they began to pray and he was praying. And the servant kept going and checking the horizon to see if there was any clouds in the horizon. And he went seven times and there was nothing. And every time he came back and told Elijah there's nothing, he said, okay, go again, go again. And it says in the scripture, he went seven times before he saw anything. And I thought about that. It was the rhema of the scripture. Go again, go again, go again, go again, go again, go again, go again. That's seven times, seven times he said, go again. And to me, I sensed that night from the word of God that I got my answer from the Lord. He was telling me to go again. In fact, when I looked at it, that was actually my seventh trip to Spain. So literally the Lord said seven times, go again. Now with this, I do have to say, we need to be cautious when it comes to the rhema word of God, because our own hearts are very deceitful. And sometimes we can find something in scripture to basically line up and be our proof text of what it is that we're desiring to do. But in that moment, we're actually being led by our flesh and not by the Holy Spirit. We say, well, this means this to me, but it can contradict, contradict the whole counsel of God or also God's character. And so that leads us to some other ways. The word of God is one of the primary ways that it leads us, but we also need to check and balance that with other things as well. The second thing on our list is God leads us by circumstances. If you look at the story we looked at today in Luke chapter 2, how did Mary and Joseph end up in Bethlehem? They ended up there by circumstances. The circumstances of the day said that they had to get up. They had an obligation. They had to travel those 80 miles. They had to go back down to Joseph's hometown. It was circumstances that led them to Bethlehem. The times and the places and the circumstances, even of our world, they can lead us. There's many ways that I'm, con I'm convinced that God has led many of us in the last year because of things like lockdowns. Led us to do things or let us have to say no to other certain things, leading us by circumstances. Closed doors and open doors, circumstances, are another way that God chooses to lead us sometimes. Sovereignly from his divine throne, he uses those things, those open doors and those closed doors to gate us and to guide us. I remember, for example, when we were on our first mission trips to Europe back in 1994, our team had spent some time in Austria and we had done a youth camp, a family camp, sorry, a family camp, and we we're working with the children. And the next week we were scheduled to go back to Croatia and spend some time with these families that we had just been ministering to. 
But of course, because of the the whole logistics, the whole uh, all the whole church had been with us for a week. They needed to go home. They needed to prepare places. They needed a few days before we could show up. And so this little gap of time, three or four days, we figured, what are we going to do? Well, right across the border was the nation of Slovenia. And my mom and some other members of the team, they had been to that country about two years before. They knew a few people. They knew some relationships. And there was the opportunity to do some outreach for those three or four days. So circumstances, the closed doors that said, don't come to Croatia yet, opened some other doors and we stepped through them. Well, that kind of sealed my fate because it was that summer I felt the calling of the Lord that eventually one day I would live and serve in Slovenia, which led to us moving over there and eventually starting the church and then panning the church over. And there's still a thriving church there that was born predominantly out of circumstances. It wasn't something that was on the agenda, but God said, this is what you're going to do. Circumstances are often things that we need to look at in our lives. Now, again, we need to be careful with this because sometimes we need to not say, well, there was a circumstance, there was an open door, so I took it. Think about Noah, or sorry, Jonah. Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh to share the gospel. And he hardened his heart. He said no, and he decided to go the other way. And guess what? When he showed up at the docks, he found a ship going in the other direction. That's what it says there in that first chapter of the book of Jonah. He found a ship. Ooh, circumstances. Look, there's an open door. God must be leading me. There's a ship going in the direction I want to go. Well, no, Jonah was actually in rebellion. Yes, he found the open door to go the other direction, but that was not the open door that God wanted him to step through. There was an open door in the other direction as well, going to Nineveh. He just refused to take it. We'll continue on the next Verbatim Word podcast as we consider how God leads us practically. As we pause here on this episode, though, let's go back to the beginning of our text today. Luke 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. It came to pass. So nonchalant. It, it just sort of happened. It was an, oh yeah, that came up. No trumpets, no hype, no fanfare announcing, God is about to do something big. The phrase, it came to pass there in Luke 2, 1, is the Greek word ginomai. It's one word. It can mean to come into existence. It can also mean to come to pass, like an event, like it does here in Luke 2. But it can also mean to arise, to appear in history, or to come onto the stage, like a historical figure that enters the scene. I love that image. Like you're at the theater, the show is about to start, the lights dim, the overture plays, the curtain opens, and that actor steps onto the stage. Ginomai. The show is about to begin. It came to pass in those days. It just sort of happened for Joseph and Mary. Joseph and Mary heard about a decree and they planned accordingly and they headed to Bethlehem and the Savior was born. How, mir how miraculous that God leads us supernaturally in the natural day-to-day -day things of this life that we have no control over. And often we don't even know it. It can come to pass that God can lead us by getting caught at a red light to slow us down so that we get somewhere two minutes later and so that we can run into someone who needs encouragement, an opportunity we may otherwise have missed. God could have been leading us. It can come to pass that God can lead us by canceling or by having the government mandate something that impacts our personal lives, much like Joseph and Mary experienced. And as frustrating as that may have been on a personal level, look at the end result. Look at the nativity scene. The savior of all mankind was born and it was all orchestrated by God the Father using human players who may not even have known they were playing into something bigger. The Christmas story is full of lives being led by God. Joseph and Mary, as we've been looking at, the wise men from the east, the shepherds watching their flocks, they all arrived at the nativity scene because God led them. In fact, it's written about the shepherds in Luke 2 verse 15. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Did you catch that? 
has come to pass with the shepherds. It's the word again, ginomai. It came to pass, and the Lord had made it known to them. Those players in the Christmas story, all individually and separately, led by God to be a part of the greatest moment in history as they arrived there at the Nativity. When God clearly showed that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that those who had come to believe would not perish but have everlasting life. What a great result from being allowed to lead, be led by God. I don't know what your year has looked like. All the disruptions and inconveniences, cancellations, being homebound, all the interruptions and mandates and dictates that thwarted your plans. But Jesus has plans to take the stage again. He said he would return, step into history once again, and that we should be waiting and watching and expecting. The time leading up to Christmas is called Advent. It means appearing. And in some places in the world, they light an Advent candle each of the Sundays prior to that coming of Christmas Day, expecting the appearing of the Messiah. Jesus will appear again. And the story will likely begin with the same way as Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that all the world should be registered. God divinely leading and guiding and aligning circumstances and players so that he can enter the scene once again. Your life too is somehow a part of that greater story. We will continue next time talking about God leading us. Until then, have a blessed Christmas remembering our Savior's birth.